welcome everyone back to our Dhamma study subject. Today is Sunday, uh, the 3rd of March 2024. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Hope everyone's doing well. And you guys are very determined to complete the all the 15 lectures together. Start from day one until final exam, which is coming up uh, in the next, uh, I believe, in May. I haven't thought about the exam yet. I also haven't thought about the assignment yet, but just hang in there. Just keep on learning and enjoy the wisdom from the Buddha. So every Saturday, Sunday, if you can make it here, that means you um, are willing to, uh, to learn something new, to improve your life, to better your life, to utilize the teaching of the Buddha into your world, whoever you are. You can be a boss, a father, a mother, a wife, a as a student, whoever you are, if you apply the Dhamma correctly, properly, you will be happy from this day onward. And that's the beauty of the Dhamma. And, and not just learning, memorizing, and trying to pass the exam. Uh, you need to be happy when you learn. You need to be smart to put the thing that you learn into practice. And you need to meditate. I keep emphasizing on meditation. Okay, People who start study Buddhism, we aware that meditation is the crucial element for us to understand uh, the nature of realities. And when we're talking about the ultimate wisdom in Buddhism, that kind of wisdom or panya must coming from the bhavana maya panya, the panya that doesn't come from thinking, doesn't come from learning from anybody, doesn't come from the books, doesn't come from the teacher, but it comes from your own mind. You close your eye, you keep the mind still, and let the inner wisdom unfold itself. And that's the Dhamma. So I hope study Dhamma would be one of the things that make your heart sing at the end of the day as well. On top of everything that you do in your life, you can play golf, you can go exercise, you can go shopping, whatever it is, but at least have, uh, have time for study Dhamma as well. Uh, we have come to the sixth week today. Uh, we will continue the Dhamma group four, part two. Last week, we, we learned the Dhamma group four, part one. If you miss the class, please go back and relearn by yourself. Uh, today will be lecture number six. Uh, continue with the Dhamma group four. We start from the Dhamma group two, right, three, four, and then we will continue to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, until the last week of this uh, Dhamma subject. And I want you to pay attention. How can you link them together? How can you connect the dots? In the elementary level of the Dhamma study, the, the curriculum is designed to provide a variety of Dhamma to students. So you may not see how they can relate it to each other. The Dhamma group 2 can be related to Dhamma group 3, group 4, group 5, group 7 or not. And that's something you should keep in mind. Don't just try to memorize, oh, this one is belong to group 2, this one belong to group 3, group 4. How can you make use of it? Some people get confused. There are so many teachings of the Buddha. What exactly that the Buddha wants me to know? What kind of teaching that the Buddha teach the most? <laughs> right? We need to be able to develop that, that kind of understanding so we don't get lost. The Buddha said he compared his teaching to the oceans. There are many oceans in this world. And every ocean, the taste of the water in the ocean is the same, which is very salty. Wherever you drink it, you know, in Asia, in Europe, in America, in Australia, the oceans, the taste of the ocean is salty. This is the same taste of the Dhamma. Whichever Dhamma that you practice, Dhamma has the same taste, which is the taste of freedom, the taste of liberation. Freedom from what? Freedom from your problem, whatever problem you are having. Freedom from uh, the defilement in your mind. If you just take one Dhamma and seriously, wholeheartedly practice that Dhamma, you can end your suffering, whatever suffering or problem that you have. What about loving kindness? What about forgiveness? What about being patient? What about mindfulness? What about Hiri Otapa that we learn? So, at the end of the day, every Dhamma will give us the same taste. The taste of freedom, the taste of happiness, right? That the mind will not be too much bothering by the defilements that already reside 
in our mind. That's something that you should keep in mind. And let's recap from what we learned from last week through these uh, quizzes, and then we go from there. Which dharma does not support the growth of wisdom? Then you need to think, what would be the dharma that support the growth of wisdom? We learn wuti, right? Wuti, wuti dharma. Wuti dharma, the dharma that support the growth of wisdom. So which one is not least in the group of wuti dharma? Easy, right? The Wuti Dhamma has these four things on the list. Finding good teacher, uh, listening to the teaching, uh, put into practice, right? Respect your teacher. Second question, which one is not the cause of prejudice or akati? Akati means bias or prejudice. What cause akati? What doesn't cause akati? There are four akati, right, that we learned. The akati that caused by love or greed. Akati that caused by fear. Payakati, akati that caused by anger, hate. Akati that caused by delusion. So these are the four things that cause akati. So the answer should be E. And the last one, which group of Dhamma protect one's credibilities? If you have this Dhamma, you will strengthen your credibilities. People are welcoming you. And the answer is the Akati, right? The four prejudice. The Wutitam, the Dhamma that support the growth of wisdom, the Chakka, the virtue that lead to prosperities, and the samadhi, or I'm sorry, sati, mindfulness, and the sampanja awareness. This is the dhamma that's uh, considered the great assistance to all kind of dhamma practice. Right? Generosity is not listed there uh, according to the akati four. This is what we learned last week. Hope that you can uh, memorize them all when we talk about the buddhi tam, dhamma that support the growth of factor. This is how we develop wisdom, right? We need to find good teacher. We don't know, we may know something, but we don't know everything. There will be someone who knows something more than us in the field that we are interested you know, to develop, such as meditation. You want to know meditation, you need to find good meditation teacher. Then learn from them, listen from them, reflect on what you learn and put into practice. Then you gain insight into how to practice meditation correctly. And then you learn about Chakka 4. The virtue that lead to the prosperity. When you have these four, your life will be on your way to be prosper. Associate with good people. So hang out with good friends. Right? And who is our best friend? The best friend is the Buddha. The Buddha has no harm to anybody. Just want to give the wisdom and wish everyone the best to live good life. Right? Somehow the Buddha is not here, so we need to find a way to get to his teaching. And read the books, uh, including not just the human being associated with the good books, good people, good teacher. That's the starting point. The technical term we call Kalayanamit or good friends and noble friends. Good friend and noble friend is considered like the sun in the morning. When the sunshine is bright, bright up the whole world. So find one good friends. They will take you to the good life, the good path of living good life. And then live in a suitable place. That's the second factor. Setting yourself in the right course and having formally done good deeds. We don't know what we did in the past, but we know that there is a law of karma exists. So uh, start changing your, yourself today, the way you think, the way you do things, the way you say things. Make sure they are wholesome. That's how you secure your future happiness and prosperity. And when we look back, we don't feel regret. I think coming to this class, to the Naktam study, is one thing that you will never feel regret because you will learn a lot and you can utilize the thing that you learn from this curriculum, from this program into your life. And the last one we learned from last week is called Akati. Akati 4. The 4 Akati. Or the 4 prejudice, right? Prejudice or bias that can cause by love, caused by hate, I don't like you, I like you. Caused by delusion or foolishness, you don't have enough information, so you make the wrong decision. 
and caused by fear. Sometimes we fear, so we do things unwholesomely, just like fear of failing the exam, so you cheat on the exam, so you can pass the exam, so your parents don't condemn you, something like that. This is called akati. Okay, so today we will continue to this, the second group of the Dhamma group 4. There are so many Dhamma group, and there is a question in the chat box asking about what about the Dhamma group 1 from Haiko. Interesting. <laughs> Somehow the Naktam level, they don't put the Dhamma group 1 into the curriculum for some reason. But yes, there is the Dhamma group 1 as well. Today I will mention a little bit of the Dhamma group 1. Maybe it's too many. That's why they don't put together. But uh, they start from the group number 2, 2, 4, 5, all the way up to 10, 11. Uh, we will keep on learning. And most important thing is how can you connect them? How can you link them? I will keep coming back and go back and forth of the thing that we learned today back to the thing that we have been learning together so you can connect the dot, so you can see a bigger picture and uh, have a broader understanding of how to utilize the Dhamma that we learned uh, from this class together. So today we learn another three more Dhamma group. Uh, the group one we call Apamada. Apamada means heedfulness. And the second group we will learn the Padana, 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 Padana means effort. I put the right in front because it is the right effort. And the last one called Atitana Dhamma. All of this may be new terms to you. Each week you will learn a new thing. So don't be surprised. And if you come across the Pali terms again, uh, please familiar with it. There is almost unavoidable for Buddhist students to to come across the Pali terms because the teaching of the Buddha are kept in the Pali. And we are fortunate that someone translate the Pali into our language, like in Thai, in Chinese, in English. So in this case, we need to use the Buddhist scripture that translates from Pali to English, which sometimes some vocabulary may not make sense. Some vocabulary from some translator may make a better sense. So we can discuss about this. If it doesn't make sense to you, then let me know. So the virtue of uh, which should be established in the mind that called Atithana Dhamma. So let's get to know these three of them today. But before we go further, I like to recap the big picture. So you guys can kind of, uh, it's kind of a reminder of what we are learning. As we learn all kind of Dhamma, various kind of Dhamma, sometimes we get confused. Where are we heading? Please don't get confused because in the Naktam uh, study from elementary, uh, intermediate, and advanced level, um, the program is designed for the student to explore uh, the Dhamma that's kept in the Tipitaka in a group. So it's easy for you to see, or oh, this thing belongs to this group, maybe help you to memorize better. But when it comes to Dhamma, Dhamma is the Dhamma. You just discuss with uh, Prachar and Warwood, right? The meaning of Dhamma. But in this case, Dhamma means the teaching of the Buddha. There's so many teachings. But this is, this is how the Dhamma works. You are here today. We were born ignorant. We don't know that we don't know. And one day, someone, something, you come across some teacher, some book that talk about the Buddha, that talk about the teaching of the Buddha. So you have some background about who the Buddha is, and what did he teach? Oh, Buddha is a, is a, he is one of the great teachers back then. He teach people to do good. And you come across some teaching. And that got you thinking about this teaching. Hey, it's interesting. It's beneficial. So let me you know, dig deeper to the teaching of this teacher. And that's dragged you here to the path of study Dhamma. And that's dragged you here to ordain as a Buddhist monk. So faith is the starting point. If you don't have faith, plus view, the right view, that this teaching is good, this teacher is good. So I have faith in his teaching. So let me following or exploring his teaching to see how much benefit I can get from his teaching. If someone ordained as a Buddhist monk, that means you take Buddhism in, uh, in, in a higher level than the lay people. You want to explore something deeper than the lay people, because lay life is difficult, right? To practice the Dharma, to meditate six hours a day. You don't have to worry about work, family, business, this and that. 
Okay, so you are here today, and one day you come across the teaching, you have faith, so you want to learn more. And where are you going? The Buddha point out that the final destination is Nibbana, or the supreme happiness, whether you want to go or not. He just let you know already. The purpose of life is to realize Nibbana. And when someone realizes Nibbana, that means birth will be ended, rebirth will be ended. If rebirth is ended, that means suffering or dukkha has, uh, will be automatically ended as well. And how can we get there? The Buddha don't just give, oh, okay, just don't, he did not just point to Nibbana, he gave us the direction, he gave us the process, the method of how to get there. To get there is not easy because you have to walk uphill, fight with greed, with hate, with delusion, and drive by ignorance. So you walk uphill. Walking uphill, you, make, you need to make an effort. If you walk downhill, it's easy, right? It's easy to watch, go watch the movie. It's more difficult to go sit and meditate three hours. You can sit there, enjoy the series of movies, three, four hours, easily. It's so easy to do that. But if you tell yourself to go meditate, 15 minutes, you feel like you almost die for some people. Because you have to walk to work uphill to do good. It's easy to do bad things. Doing bad things, you just walk downstream. Walk downhill is so easy to do something bad. No need to think, no need to use mindfulness, no need to use Joniso Manasikara, no need to worry about it. Just, just do it. And now you realize that there are the consequences of you doing good and bad. So your goal is to follow the teaching of the Buddha. You may not want to realize Nibbana, but you just want to be happy. But either one, we use the same approach. So you need to make sure that you observe precept, right? And then you practice meditation. I like to call the mind development. Sometimes we call samadhi, sometimes we call concentration. And then you need to develop your wisdom or panya. One, two, three. These three things are the framework that the Buddha give to anybody, both monk and the lay people. We can use the same approach. You can do intensively because there are many layers of precept. There are many layers of mind development and there are many layers of wisdom, which we will discuss a little bit today. For the lay people, five precept is good enough, sometimes eight precept. If you want to be happy, make sure you observe precept. Is it enough? No. Here you need to have three of these in place to secure your happiness. You observe precept, you meditate, you study Dhamma. Keep on doing this for the rest of your life. So you can secure your happiness in this lifetime and for the future lifetime too. And this is the big picture. When uh, it's about we are, we are managing our day-to-day -day problem. And that problem, the technical term is called Dukkha. You can look at Dukkha as problem or suffering. Each day we are facing difficulty in life. Things always go wrong. Things always doesn't go, thing doesn't always go as we want it to be. To expect uh, more customer today at your restaurant, somehow even though it's Friday night, but it has end up having less customer than last week. You are suffering. How do you deal with this? So precept has to be there. Meditation also has to be there, and wisdom also has to be developed too. So you can overcome your day-to-day -day suffering or dukkha until we're talking about the highest uh, wisdom that removes these three mental defilements from our mind, then we can realize the ultimate uh, uh, happiness, which is Nibbana, right? So whatever Dhamma that you learn, it should help you to lessen your suffering in life. It should help strengthen your happiness on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether you are a Buddhist monk or you are a lay person, business owner, father, mother, doesn't matter. And this is the picture that I like you to keep in mind as we study Dhamma together. Whether it's something you feel easy or something you feel difficult. Uh, I mean the Dhamma subject that we will be learning together. So let's start off with the first one we call Appamada Dhamma. Appamada, according to the Pali dictionary, translate to heedfulness, earnestness, vigilance. 
อัปมาบะ that mean there is something hindered here right when you see a uh, a uh, mean anti or something not something opposite อัปมาทะ opposite to ปมาทะปมาทะ mean carelessness อัปมาทะ mean non carelessness or heedfulness this is extremely important when it's come to the word อัปมาทะ in one teaching the Buddha said heedfulness or อัปมาทะ is the deadless path Oppositely, p a m a t a or heedlessness, is the path to death. Those who are heedful do not die. Heedless are like the dead. What does it mean? To me, this is deep. Okay, heedfulness is the path of deadless. That means if someone practice this a p a m a t a dhamma or practice heedfulness. You will not die. <laughs> it doesn't mean we don't die. We will die. The body will break apart one day. But in this case, the death means we will not die from from good deeds, from doing good things, from wholesome qualities. We be not careless. Let's use the same example, right? The guy cheat on the exam because he doesn't want to look bad. He doesn't want to get blamed by his friend or his parent, whoever it is. So he decided to cheat on the exam so he can pass. So he already died from truthfulness. He died from goodness. Every time he look back on what he did in the future, he will feel guilty and feel shameful of his own action, because bad is always bad. It never be able to be good because it is bad. More the minor or major thing that we do that consider bad. Same thing, good is always good. If you do something good, even though you did not cheat on the exam and you fail the exam, you may regret that you fail the exam. But you did your best. You did not prepare enough, so you accept the consequence. And when time goes by, and when you look back, you can say that in my whole life, I never cheat on the exam. So you have, you proud of yourself. You proud of what you did. The reason you can do that because you, you develop something called h i s f u l n e s s Right, h i s f u l n e s s So you don't die from the good things. But if you are careless, you are dead. People who live life carelessly, the Buddha said, this person is like a, a, a someone who already died. Someone who already died. And in another sense, h i s l e s s n e s s and h i s f u l n e s s is about carelessness. Right? If you live life carelessly, if you cook, you can cut yourself. If you drive, the car can be crashed. Because you are careless, you may talk on the phone, you may watch the movie while driving or while cooking, and you end up hurting yourself. And this is because you are careless of what you do. You lost mindfulness. You are not mindful of what you do. So what we learn is they always linked it together about mindfulness and about the concentration, about awareness. Here, let me show you this picture. In the first week, we learn that. The dhamma, the virtue that consider the great assistant in the group of two, is called sati and s a m p a c h a n y a The awareness, the mindfulness, and the awareness. This one, everyone should should be able to remember by now. And in another teaching, someone asks Venerable Sariputta, "What is the virtue or the dhamma that consider the great assistant to all dhamma?" Now we come to the Dhamma Group One. Sariputta select one thing out of his wisdom that learn all the Dhamma from the Buddha. He choose one thing. The Dhamma of Great Assistant is h i s f u l n e s s right here. All of this contain the teaching of the Buddha, which he said there are 84,000 t e a c h i n g that kept in the Buddhist text. If we divide it in group, we see the Vinaya, this one, 21,000. The Sutta, another twenty one thousand, and the Abhidhamma, another forty two thousand topic. All together is eighty four thousand teaching of the Buddha. There's a lot of teaching. If you study the text by yourself, you will get confused. It's too many teaching, you don't even know where to start. But this picture s u m m a r i z e everything in this because the ultimate aim of someone come to this spiritual path or. Uh, following the teaching of the Buddha is to realize nibbana or the nirota, the same word. Uh, Sariputta said, "One thing only: if you develop, it, this will protect you from falling down to the wrong path. 
did you support you from day one to the day that you realized Dibana and that thing he give the credit to something called Apamada or the heedfulness and how can you link Sati and Sampachanya or the mindfulness and the clear comprehension into this teaching into this picture a man cannot be called this person is heedful if he lack of mindfulness and when mindfulness arises and that give rise to awareness or the clear comprehension so you don't make a mistake if you are mindful if you eat you focus 100% with you with what you eat if you cook you focus on cooking if you drive you focus on driving that means you're not careless and the reason you can do that because you are so focused you are so mindful of what you do 100% so sati and sampatanya or mindfulness and the clear comprehension They are here. They support his fullness. So if we talk about two dhamma group two that support all the dhamma, this would be the one. If we talk about the dhamma group one, the answer is this one: the virtue of great assistant is his fullness. You know, review by, reflex by Sariputta. If you ask me, or if I were asked, with all the dhamma of the Buddha, all of this dhamma, eighty four thousand, in front of me. If I were allowed to choose one thing to practice that can secure my journey to realize nibbana, from day one until the day that I realize nibbana, I would choose sati. Some of you may choose precepts. Some of you may choose meditation. Some of you may choose forgiveness. Some of you may choose patience. Some of you may choose hiri otapa. It's up to your understanding. It's up to your understanding. But for me, I would choose sati. Why? Because sati is here, sati is uh, the dhamma that support us to study all of this dhamma. Is there anything in this world, any action in your life that you have been doing or you about to do, that you can do without sati, and then you can be successful and safe from the defilements? There is no such thing. So you must develop sati. You must develop s a m p a c h a n y a And sampachanya will come after you have sati, right? It cannot rising by itself. That's we. I think we did talk about this already. So in this picture, I just want to see that. Just want you to see the heedfulness is extremely important for us to be success, to be happy in life, to be safe in the journey of our spiritual developments. We must develop sati sampachanya. We must understand the concept of apamata dhamma that the Buddha teach. And Apamada Dhamma, there is a sutra called Apamada Sutra as well. It's my privilege, okay, to be able to uh, do some research and find the sutta that related to the Dhamma topic that we learn here. It benefit me definitely, and hopefully it benefit you as well. Because when you study the text that uh, uh, you download, you know, before we study the, the before we start this class, there is a handbook that give out to you. And in that handbooks, or in every book that talk about the Dhamma study, whether in Thai, like this, in Thai or in English, there's no such reference. I don't even know where did they get it from, which sutra. So it's my job to go verify that this teaching did really exist in the Buddhist text. So that give me. Uh, I have to make an extra effort, try to locate this kind of uh, relevance, the sutra that uh, we will be discussing each each class each time that we meet in the uh, in each dhamma subject. So here the Buddha said, b i k u you should apply apamada dhamma or heedfulness in four area. Number one, abandon unwholesome action, cultivate good action, and neglect both okay unwholesome. Cannot you cannot neglect to abandon bad thing and. And cultivating good thing, and abandon unwholesome speech. The first one is action, bodily action. Second one is 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 about your your speech or verbal action. Cultivate good speech and neglect neither. Abandon thought, unwholesome thought. So basically, body, speech, and mind, or the or the way you think. Cultivate good thought, neglect neither. Abandon wrong view. This is number four. View is number four. Wrong view. Cultivate the right view and neglect neither. 
when a bhikkhu has abandoned unwholesome action, cultivate good action, abandon wrong will, cultivate right will, he will feel no apprehension of fear regarding his coming death. This is interesting and it's not in your book. Why did the Buddha say that? If you develop all of this, that person, okay, if a man develop all, all of this, that man has no fear to the death. That means the person has confidence that he has done the right thing, accumulate merit, right? So he has no fear. When death come, when it's come, it's come. There's no regret. So if we put into picture, this is how it looks like. There are things to be giving up. There are things that need to be cultivated. If you do all of this, these four things is called the four heedfulness or the apamada. First, give up unwholesome bodily action. Second, give up unwholesome verbal action. And the third, give up unwholesome mental action and give up the wrong view. Not only that, you need to do opposite. If you give up unwholesome bodily action, you need to cultivate wholesome bodily action. If you give up unwholesome verbal action already, you need to cultivate wholesome verbal action. And if you give up unwholesome mental action, you don't think bad already, you should cultivate the mind to think good, wholesome mental action. And you, if you already give up the wrong view, you should cultivate the right view too. This is the beauty of the teaching of the Buddha. Not just, oh, you don't do bad. Don't do bad, it doesn't mean you are good, right? It only means you don't do something bad. So you need to make an effort to do good too, in order to be you know, the student of the Buddha. Sometimes people feel like, I observe precept, I am a man of precept. Sometimes five precept, sometimes eight precept, once a week, once a month. I should be considered a good man, right? The answer is not really. There are many people who are uh, observing precept on a daily basis, but they are selfish. They are stingy. They never give. They never help. Everything is me and mine. But they don't kill, don't lie, no sexual misconduct, no, no stealing, no intoxicants. But I just don't want to help anybody. That's not the idea of someone come to study the Dhamma. So if you give up the bad thing, you should set your mind to do good thing. The way you think, the way you do things, the way you say things, the way you see and understand things should be developed toward wholesome or skillful action. And how can we do all of this? It seems to be a lot, right? And the good news is, the Buddha once said, if, if there is one thing that when it gets developed and cultivated, that thing will bring happiness to our life. And that thing is the mind. The mind is everything, right? If you can control only your mind, you will have nothing more to control. So guard your own mind. This is the teaching that the Buddha gave to the monk. There was a monk who ordained, maybe newly ordained monk, and he realized there are so many rules, 200 rules, 300 rules, so many rules, and he doesn't want to make a mistake in breaking precept. So he seeks for disrobing. I don't think I can be a good monk. Let me leave the robe and go back home. And he met, came across the Buddha. The Buddha stopped him and asked him what he is doing. He said, I'm, I'm leaving. I don't think I can take care of these too many rules. The Buddha said, okay, can you take just one rule? Got that got the monk thinking. Okay, that may be, I think it's possible to just take care of one thing. What would be that thing? The Buddha said, you take care of the mind only. And how can you take care of the mind if you don't have sati? Sati it has to be here has to be there as always. When you have sati, automatically sampachanya or the clear awareness or clear comprehension will start function. If the mind starts thinking of something bad, then you stop. The reason you can stop that thinking because sati is the, there is the function of sati to catch, right? That now your mind attention is moved to something else. When you know that the mind moves, that means you are mindful. And how can you bring it back? And that's the function or the duty of Sampachanya. So you bring it back. Monk, we, not, we cannot eat dinner. And when you meditate in the evening session, you feel like, ah, oh, I'm so hungry. So you, you start thinking of food, of your favorite food, of ice cream, this and that. And once that thought start popping up in your mind, and you can catch it, that means your mindfulness is very sharp. 
So you catch that thought, and then you think, oh, I'm not supposed to think of eating dinner because I'm a monk. I am a man of precept. Then you, your mind come back and continue to meditate. It may be going out ten times, hundred times, thousand times during the session. It doesn't really matter. The matter is, every time the mind think, you know, and when you know, you can do something about it. Okay, so you just got one thing. Okay, and this is something I just add on to you. We talking about apamada or heedfulness. The apamada or heedfulness, it is an internal factor. Nothing to do with the outside. Nothing to do with your friends or your teacher or the book that you read. It's a it's about yourself to understand that you you should you should follow these four thing right, giving up this thing and cultivate this thing. That's why it's called the four heedfulness. It's it's subjective. It's internal factors. And to do good, keep in mind that not just you having this mindset or attitude built, you need to hang out with kalayanamit or good friends too, because one day you will start somehow uh, maybe feeling like giving up or feeling tired of doing good thing. When you hang out with good friends, they will always bring you back to the right path. So make sure you have more good friend in your life. And this is the upper m a t a or the h e a t f u l n e s s Um, another thing that you have learned already, and you will be learning about this more often as we go along, is there is an ad- another element that called the Diodiso Manasikara, or the skillful reflection. Hope you still remember the Diodiso Manasikara, the skillful reflection. These two elements they are equally important. Diodiso Manasikara is a member of wisdom element. It is the tool to be used to reflect something deeper. You learn about five precepts, you reflect, and then you gain wisdom. Then you can put into practice. And when you practice, if it doesn't go right, you stop and you reflect again, and then you fix it. You put into practice again. That's the function of the y o n i s o m a n a s i k a r a But the a p a m a t a or h i s f u l n e s s sati and s a m p a c h a n y a they fall into the group of mind. They are the member of the samadhi. Or the concentration element in the threefold training or the t r i s i k a which is again is the short form, short format of the noble eightfold path. We will, I think, I have the slide of the noble eightfold path. Just, just hang in there. Uh, the reason I mention this because you're gonna come across this when it's come to uh, wisdom, when it's come to the function of each dharma that support us to continue. You no, know, doing good thing without falling off the path of wholesomeness. a p a m a d a Dhamma is a member of this samadhi or concentration section, which govern the use, the the use <coughs> of the two of y o n i s o m a n a s i k a r a That's how they work. Okay, if this too much for you, it's okay, because I feel like you, uh, some of you may, it may be benefit some of you who study Dhamma already. Okay. And that's uh, that's about the a p a m a d a Dhamma. Any question so far about the first subject today? Because the Dhamma that we study will drag us to the path of wholesomeness. Will drag us to the path toward Nibbana. We practice the Dhamma to lessen greed, lessen hate, lessen delusion and ignorance from our mind. <coughs> When you do this, you give up bodily, verbally, mentally action, right? Uh, unwholesome action. That means you fight with the defilement. So you don't say bad, you don't do bad, you don't think bad, and you give up the wrong view. You develop the right view. You develop the body, uh, bodily action, wholesome bodily action, verbal action, and mental action. If you don't have mindfulness, you cannot do this. Someone says something bad, you will say something bad to that person, right? Someone, if you like something, you go after that thing. If you don't like something, You run away from that thing, or you fight with that thing. This is the nature of human, or the human instinct. So we need to apply the dharma that we learn, so we can live life uh, happily and have less problem on a day-to-day basis as we go through life. Now let's move on to the second group, which is the a p a m a d a I'm sorry, the padana, padana dharma, padana. According to the Pali dictionary, it means the effort. The shift, the foremost, the exertion, the striving, the effort, or the perseverance—it depends on the 
translation, the translator point of view, which view that which term that he feel fit into the context of the sutra that he study or he translating. In this case, pamada we can translate to effort. And there's a sutra that relevant to this is called Padana Sutta from Ankutra Nikaya. It said, restraint and giving up, restraint and giving up, developments and uh, preservation. These are the four efforts taught by the kinsmen of the sun, this point to the Buddha. And a bhikkhu who keenly apply this may attain the ending of suffering. You see, all the teaching, all the Dhamma point to end of suffering. And end of suffering imply that that person realized Nibbana. If we feel like Nibbana is too far away, I don't think I can realize it in this lifetime or in, in the near future lifetime. But we can look at Nibbana here and now. It's called, uh, it's called the mimics of the real Nibbana. The Nibbana here and now means you, your suffering or your problem end today. Give you example. If you have been holding resentments, bad thought towards someone for some reason, with your foolishness, with your delusion, with your story view to that person, and you don't like seeing him, every time you see him, you're getting agitated, you're getting mad, you don't want to see his face, you don't want to hear his voice. Somehow that person is a person in your life cycle, you cannot run away. Every day you wake up, you see him, you are suffering. Suffering means the mind cannot at peace. The mind cannot at peace means the mind cannot experience the temporary nibbana. Once you develop the right understanding, you get to the cause of problem. Why did you feel like that toward that person? Maybe you misunderstanding him of, about something. So you start to pause your thinking. You start to look deeper. Why did I feel like that? And then find a way to sort it out. Maybe have openly talk to the person or check out information from some other one from someone else to clear it out, clear it away. When you can forgive the person fully, your problem solved, you will be a happy person, a happy being right away. The moment that you forgive, that moment is the moment of happiness right away. You don't have to wait until the day you die about to die and ask for forgiveness. And this happened to a lot of people. They experience suffering. And I like to call it an unnecessary suffering. You don't have to. Life is suffering already. We get old, we get ill, we are about to die. Every day we go to bed with, with an ill body, with a body that's about to break apart. We don't even know whether we wake up tomorrow. We will, we will wake up tomorrow or not. So, and they're all the same. People we love, people we hate, they're subject to the same law of nature. So this is, this is something that we should develop, right? And then this will help us to end. All of this will help us to end the suffering. And the sutra is called Padana Sutta, which is quite uh, worthy. And I summarize it to you here. There are four things that the Buddha teach out of this um, teaching. There are four kinds of effort. The first one is called Sangwara Padana, mean the efforts to prevent the evil from arising. Pahana, pahana, padana, mean the effort to abandon the arising evil. This one easy, perhaps easy to understand, right? If you group them together. So if you, if you know that you don't have this bad habit or bad things, you make sure that they don't have, this bad thing will not happen to you. If you know that you already have bad habit or bad thing in your life, you make sure that you find a way to abandon or give up all of them. Let's say you you kind of a stingy person. You don't want to give. You know this is bad. You should give more. right? And once you realize that I have the stingy mind, so you find a way to abandon or work on this area of your life. You start to give. Give a little thing first. Give more often until you feel comfortable with your giving. That means you abandon the stingy mind or the arising evil that you already have. Or the bad thing that you never have, let's say gambling. You don't go gambling because you don't like it. So stay away from it. Don't go gambling. Don't go drinking. Don't go drugging. This is what it means by effort. You make an effort not to be involved with the bad thing. You make an effort to abandon the bad thing, bad habits that you already cultivate in your life. What about forgiveness? Are you a person who is easy to forgive? 
or are you a person who always hold on the resentment towards someone all the time, never be able to let go? Think about it. And the third effort is called b a w a n a To develop is the effort to develop wholesome qualities, and anurakana mean to the effort to uh, maintain the wholesome quality. Similar, right? You know that you have the good thing that you already built. Make sure you you sustain that. Make you that you you secure that. If you meditate every day one hour already, this is good. Continue to do that. Don't sit less than one hour. Just continue to develop to go to one hour and a half to go to two hours. So maintain that good qualities. If you a man who already observe precept, continue to observe precept, and. The developments of the the good thing that you don't have, right? Like I said, if you uh, you know that meditation is good, ob- observing precept is good, your friend do it, but you don't do it, then you may find way or somehow start to think of how can you develop those wholesome quality into your life. Okay. So question from Haiko: This uh, parana is the mean with the right effort in the noble eight four paths. Okay, perfect question. Okay. This is the one. The right effort is here in the eight four path. This is a short version, right? Uh, de- the development of sila, the development of mind or samadhi or concentration, and the development of panya or wisdom that I mentioned earlier is a short version. The three four training is a short version of the eight four path. This picture. So we need to keep coming back and forth, help you to memorize better. This is the eight four path. This one, the precept, the mind, and the wisdom, right? And if you put them into the category like this, it's easy for you to understand and and perhaps help you to memorize much better. So the eight four path, we will not discuss about this today, but I just want to pinpoint which relevant to the question from Heigl. So there are eight things on the list: the right view, right intention, fall into the wisdom group. Right speech, right action, right livelihood fall into the sila or the moral, moral morality or ethical conduct, and the right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration fall into the group of samadhi, concentration or the mind development. Right effort, according to the text, the definition definition is exactly the same as padana. As you come across the teaching like this, the Buddha use uh, maybe different term to teach different group of students. But the body of knowledge or the essence of the teaching is the same. When it comes to padana, when it comes to uh, effort, you see in this case the word used is called w a y a m a or w i r i y a w i r i y a which means persevere effort. Sometimes another meaning of w i r i y a is brave. This is interesting. Brave means you brave to do good. You brave to give up the bad. You brave to wake up early 4:30 to meditate. You brave to cook the food and offering to the monk at six o'clock in the morning, which not the normal time that you wake up. So you brave to do good. It's called v i r i y a or vayama, and samma mean right, right? The right vayama. You not brave to do bad, right? You stay, stay, uh, stay up all night just to play the video game. You just do thing nonsense like this. This is opposite to samma vayama. You don't, you don't persevere to do bad thing all night. You should do good thing, right? Meditate all night and watching movie all night. You need to think about it. They 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 yield different result. You see, when it come to this, the definition, you now you see that they are the same, right? It's to prevent the arising of unarising, unwholesome state, to abandon unwholesome state that have already arisen, to arouse the wholesome mistype, to arouse the wholesome state that have not yet arisen. And to maintain the perfect wholesome state that already arises, okay. But in this uh, right effort in the noble eightfold path, it's more focused on the dharma experience about the defilements that start to control your minds. But in general, the padana is the effort that you use in the day-to-day life to make sure that you don't do bad. You continue to do good. You make an effort. You brave to do the good thing. You brave not to do the bad thing. You brave to reject your friend who hand you the alcohol. No, I don't need it. Go ahead. Can you do that? Do you brave enough to say no to alcohol? To say no to drug? Say no to the bad thing. 
these days in the society is difficult, right? When in you in the business, you go to the party, and your boss hand you the alcohol, the drink. Can you say no to your boss? Can you be bold? Can you be brave to say, "No, boss, thank you." So you think about it, and this is something that related to what we learned exactly last week. Okay, any question? Anything about the padana, the four kind of effort? Not so difficult. We will move on to the third one, the last one today, which is called the atitana dhamma. Atitan is like you, you make a resolution, you make a wish. One meaning of atitan is the foundation, the decision, the resolution, the self determination, the resolute determination, according to the dictionary. Atitan dhamma appears in this sutra, t h a t u v i b a n k a sutra. The Buddha said uh, this person has four foundation. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the foundation of wisdom. Number one, the foundation of truth, the foundation of relinquishment or liberality, and the foundation of peace or tranquility. There are four things that mention, e d and again, there is no explanation. If we put into the list. a t i t a n Dhamma, according to the curriculum of the elementary level of Nakam study, it said is the virtues which should be established in one's own mind. It should be established. And last week we learned the Chakka, right? The Chakka, the four Chakka, the Dhamma that's uh, willing us to the prosperities. And how can we link them together? So today we learn another four Dhamma that. We should establish, and when we establish this in our mind, it leads us to be happy and leads us to the successful of life. You still remember the chakka? There are four things, right? That mentioned in the chakka, four chakka: living in the suitable place, associating with good friends or noble friends, you know, possessing the right resolve, or setting yourself in the good course or the right course, and the last one, having merit done from the past. That's the virtue that building one to prosperity that we learned from last week. So if you following that four dhamma from the chakka dhamma, you will have a possibility, right, to live good life, to be prosper, to good things, all kind of good thing in life. When you live in a good place, when you hang out with good friends, when you set yourself in the right course, such as uh, observing precept, you know, uh, meditate every day, study dhamma every day like this, and then the last one having merit done in the past life. Which again, we don't know what we did in the past, but we can secure the future of success and happiness by start doing good things today. The way we think, the way we do things, the way we say things, and that's the chakka four, the virtue that we learned from last last week. But today we learn something new, which is a t i t h a n dhamma, and a t i t h a n dhamma is the uh, virtue which should be established in the mind. Everyone who wants to be successful and happy should establish. These four things. That's the idea of a t i t a n dhamma that we about to discuss. If a man want to realize nibbana, that man need to establish this one, these four thing in his mind. If a lay person or anybody want to live life happy, for the moment nibbana later, you can also use the same approach by applying set determination of these four thing into your life. Then you are on your way to be success and happy. See, there are all kind of dharma teaching of the Buddha that teach people to live good life, and in each dharma that he teach, they also come with level of practice that you can practice. There is no end to it. You can go uh, lightly, you can take it a little bit more serious, or you can take it extreme. It's up to you. It's subjective, but no matter what level you want to practice, at the end of the day, the dharma that you practice correctly and consistently. Should bring you peace and happiness, and lessen your problem in life. So start from number one, panya. You hear the word panya often, or wisdom. In this case, according to the manual, it translates to panya is to know what should be known. What does it mean? What is to know what should be known? What does it mean, panya or wisdom? What is to know what should be known? Panya. Can be divided into three level. This elementary level or the first level 
is the worldly wisdom. You have ability to teach yourself out of problem, to teach yourself to live good life, to know that observing precept is good, killing is bad, stealing is bad. Not only you know that, you don't involve, you don't get involved. You don't support anybody in your life to do bad things like that. So that means you have the right view in the worldly level. But in the Dhamma world or in the Dhamma level, in the deeper than that, now the, the second layer of Panya, we call the understanding, the true nature of things. We talk about the law of nature, the law of impermanence, suffering and non-self or uncontrollable. Now, if a person understands this law, that person has this kind of wisdom, this level of wisdom. And the advanced level of wisdom is the wisdom that helps you to be able to destroy or remove the mental impurities from your mind completely, to remove greed, hatred, and delusion and ignorance completely from your mind. This is the level of wisdom. But in this case, the Panya is to know that what caused your suffering to avoid doing that. You avoid that cause. Don't get involved with killing, lying, sexual misconduct, drug, intoxicant. Don't do it. So stay out of the problem. Then you can be, uh, you, your body, speech, and mind can be pure. That means you're on your way, right? To, to be happy. And perhaps one day you can realize Nibbana too. And the second element is called Satcha, the truthfulness. <clears throat> and the manual said to get the effect of what has to get the effect of what has has been done which is again is unclear right difficult to understand to get the effect of what has been done indeed such a mean the truth the truth means you take things seriously you determine to do good thing you know alcohol is bad you determine not to get involved with alcohol you know meditation is good, observing precept is good. You determine to observe precept, to meditate. You are honest, you are sincere with people around you. You do what you say, you say what you do. That's the idea of satcha or truthfulness. And <clears throat> the chakha, the relinquishments or the liberalities mean to renounce what is the enemy of the mind? What is the enemy of the mind? There are two kinds of chakha, right? You give. Chakha, can, you can think of giving. The word that we learned last time is called dana, right? But chakha comes in the deeper sense than the dana. You can give material thing, or you can give, uh, give out the, um, uh, we can call the defilements. Sometimes you have bad emotion. Can you can you let go of those bad emotion, or vetana, or emotion, or feeling? Material thing easy to understand. You give clothes, give food, give things to people around you that that make you happy, that make people like you, right? At the same time, in that giving, you may have a hidden agenda. Why you give this this thing to this person? Maybe you want them to love you. Maybe you want them to select you to be the boss the next terms, whatever it is. But Jaka comes in the deeper sense than that. You give out the bad thing, bad intention in your mind. You give out laziness, you give out fear, you give out angriness, agitated mind, you give out the, the bad thing that you did in the past. You just find a way to let it go. So it doesn't bother your mind. This is the enemy of the mind. The mind will not be able to become, to be happy, Every time you keep holding on that thing that you did and you don't, uh, the, the bad thing that you did in the past. And when it's come to upasama, upasama or the tranquility, this is the idea to keep the mind calm and clear in the good state of mind at all time. You abandon this. You know how to manage when the hindrances come to your mind, when you meditate, when you fall asleep, how do you deal with sleepiness? How do you deal with restlessness? How do you deal with lust, with anger? So you can calm the mind down. So you can keep the mind in the quiet state or the calm state at all time. So this is something we should set in mind in these four things. To have the wisdom. Not to neglect the wisdom. The reason 
uh, I mean, when you come to the Dhamma class like this, okay, you work on this one. You develop wisdom. Whoever give the Dhamma talk, listen to them. Wherever, you, whenever you have a chance to access to the teacher, to the good book, you know, take it. Don't neglect it. And don't feel like, oh, I already know that. Oh, this teacher is not good. This teacher is bad. There's no such thing. You need to be open-minded and listen to them. And one teaching, the Buddha said, whenever you have a chance to listen to the Dhamma, whether that Dhamma you heard before, whether the monk or the person who keeps the Dhamma may have less education than you, may ordain after you, your job is to let go that, that view. Listen to them wholeheartedly. And then you will pick up something. When your mind is refined, you, you will understand something that you may never realize that, hey, how come I didn't understand this before? So do not neglect to find wisdom. And second is to safeguard the truth or satcha. Okay, Keep your word sincere. Do what you say, say what you do. And continue Okay, to determine to do good. If you uh, want to build the good habit of meditate every day or observe five precepts every day or observe eight precepts once a week, you determine to do that. You're true to yourself. You truth to the Dhamma. If you truth to yourself, then you can be maintain the truth to others too. You will keep your word. You will be a man of your word. You said, "Go oh, this week. I'm gonna meditate every day." And all of a sudden, oh, today is too hot. Today I'm tired. Today a lot of work. I'll do it next week. That means you're not you're not a truthful person. Okay. And number three, to foster the relinquishment of the jaka, to keep on get rid of the bad thought. Getting up the bad emotion, the bad feeling that happen when it's arrived. And to train oneself in tranquilities. Can you remain calm in all situations? In all stimuli that come hitting your life. The bad word, the bad situation, see something that you don't like, see something that you like. Can you deal with that to keep the mind calm at all stages, in all situations? And again, how can you do all this if you are not mindful? Sati and Sampachanya, they are the virtue of great assistance. And when you have Sati and you will be a person with his fullness. You see, this is how you connect the Dhamma that you learn together. Okay, and this is the reference in case you want to check it out in these three sutra by yourself. They're not that long. Okay. Any questions so far? So please have a good evening, good day, wherever you are. Please stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy, and hope to see you once again next Sunday.